Well, thank you again for your welcome. And uh, as many of you know, I am a, a Sheffield Wednesday supporter. And uh, this week I was watching Wednesday play on Wednesday. They usually play on a Tuesday for some unknown reason, but they were playing on a Wednesday. And you may have been unfortunate enough to watch it on television, uh, playing Man City, one of the best teams in Europe, in the FA Cup. I went along, I don't know why, because I could have gone and watched it free on telly, but you're a supporter, so you pay your money and you go, drove all the way to Sheffield with my lad, and we watched it. Okay, I still believe that Sheffield Wednesday will win the FA Cup whilst I'm alive. I've been watching 50 years, I've seen semi-finals, I've seen a final, we've never won the FA Cup yet. But we put a really good performance up against Man City, only for it to completely be ruined by losing to Brentford 5-0 on Saturday, so there you go. But we only lost by one goal to Man City, and the week before, Man City had beaten Real Madrid by one goal, which means we're as good as Real Madrid. Sheffield Wednesday is... is like, that's the way we make the logic. Sheffield Wednesday last won the FA Cup in 1935, a little bit before my time. But they will win it again. I will do believe it's just a matter of time. That word yet, Sheffield Wednesday haven't won the FA Cup yet, is an important word. In sports psychology, it's a lot about you haven't won yet, so get up and try again. Someone We need a sports psychologist at Sheffield Wednesday, we really do. But there we go. We use it at school, it's Emmanuel where I'm the chaplain, we have a growth mindset about keeping on going. We've Christianized it using Romans chapter 5 verse 4, which if you know that word, uh, that verse, it talks about perseverance creates character, character produces hope. We call it PCH, perseverance, character, hope. So the youngsters keep on persevering and that builds character and character builds hope. We don't use the end of the verse before, which says, if you know the your Romans chapter 5, it says, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. It's not something you put on front of your, your school, you know. Come to school and suffer, you know, it's not real. But some of you looking, thinking back to your, uh, your school days may have thought that's actually very appropriate, a time of suffering. It is time of hard work and pressure for the youngsters as well as the staff. But there is a real principle there about persevering produces character, and character produces hope. It's not a really uplifting word, perseverance, is it really? Especially as it has the word severe in the middle, persevere. But I'm just going to think about it a little bit this morning, because our reading uh, from Luke picks up and talks about perseverance. At this time of Lent, it is something which is really important. I was talking to all our youngsters only, I think, a week ago uh, with their Lent assemblies. And, of course, I was doing about the temptations of Jesus, which we traditionally do, don't we, every year at Lent. And I'm sure you've been thinking about it. And an amazing story about the way that when Jesus at his baptism received, as I said to the kids, the superpower of God, the superpower that allowed him to raise the dead and heal the sick and walk on water, he had that incredible power but it was very important that he had the right character and the perseverance to make sure that it, he used it in the right way so that there would be hope for us. If he'd have used it wrongly, he wouldn't have been raised from the dead, would he? And that's our great hope at Easter. And there's the hope at the end of perseverance and character. And I was asking the youngsters that if they had a superpower, would they use it right? And I said, look at Doctor Who. He's not really a superpower, but a time lord, but has that superpower of time travel. And they all looked at me like, what are you talking about, Doctor Who? No, the kids have got no idea about Doctor Who. I'm still scared by Cybermen, but there you go, that's the, that, I don't even feel the same. But, you know, I was just saying, just imagine if you could jump in your TARDIS and go forward in time. Would you use that power for yourself or for others? Don't know about you, I would go past the Euro Millions lottery results, find out the result, go back in time, go to my news agents and put down the numbers. Obviously, I'd be doing it for charity, and I'd give some to church. Maybe even some would come to St. Peter's, you know, for... But basically, I would make millions of pounds until they sussed it out by about the fourth time I'd done it, that something was going wrong. We would re we'd use our superpowers for ourselves, as well as for others. Jesus has that power. So what's the first thing he's done, he's told to do? He's told to go into the wilderness, and it's tested. Can he persevere not eating for 40 days? I love it when the scriptures say, and he was hungry. 
You don't really need to put that. If you haven't eaten for 40 days, you are starving to death. Never mind hungry. And of course, that word, that evil word in his head, the devil saying, use your superpowers to change the rock into bread. But Jesus won't do it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. He persevered. He showed he had self-control and character. And because of that, we have hope. If he'd have misused it, we'd have no hope. And that's what we remember, don't we, at this Lenten time. But on that story, Luke chapter 18, that we had read to us, Jesus talks about perseverance. He tells us that this is an important thing, not just shows us, he tells us. He told this parable to say that we should always pray and not give up. We should persevere in what we're doing. And there's two characters, isn't there? There's one, a crusty old male judge, And we read that he didn't care about anybody. He didn't care about popularity. He didn't care about what people thought of him. And equally, he didn't care about God. He was amoral. He just didn't care about being good. He was just his own boss. So we've got that man. And then the other character is this uh, woman. First of all, she's a woman in a very male-dominated world. She's also, we read, a widow, so she has lost her her spouse, her partner, and so there's no income coming into the house, and there really was next to no respectable way that a woman could make money in those days. But on top of that, most likely, she had dependents. She had children eating her out of house and home. How How does that equation all add up? It's very hard. She's just open to charity. She's very open to being abused. She is incredibly vulnerable. So we've got a judge who cares about nobody and has all the power, and we have a woman who has no power and is extremely vulnerable. And we read that she went to the judge, and she says, grant me justice against my adversary. Somebody was abusing her. Maybe a corrupt landlord. Who do we know? Someone who was maybe giving her charity but wanting things in return. What do we know about? Something was absolutely not right. Now, we tell the children at school, my part of my work in safeguarding, is if anybody's trying to abuse you, anyone's trying to groom you, you tell. You tell. You take control of that situation. You don't be controlled by it. And it's a great story about what you should do here. The widow, even though she must have known what the judge was like, she goes and she tells him, I want justice. Grant me justice. But of course he refuses to listen for some time. We don't know how long, maybe in ages. He refused. Why would he do anything? This woman had no money. This woman had no standing. What could he give to her, to him? What on earth could she give him? This was extra work. And he wasn't bothered about it. He didn't care what people think. He wasn't bothered about people saying, oh, isn't that judge nice? He he, he, he really looked after that widow. He do not care. And he do not care about God. He do not care about the judgment day. But she persevered. She persevered. She kept on going. On and on. And yet, in the end, we realize he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I think in brackets, nagging me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out. Or in my translation here, come and attack me. It's a very strange little word, a phrase in the Greek. It literally means she will stop striking me under the eye. Now, I don't quite know what she was doing, but, you know, you can almost get the idea she's got her finger and she's prodding away at him, and he's thinking, I'm going to get a black eye if she keeps doing this to me. You know, the sort of thing. I, um, at school, I do lunchtime and break cues and things like that. It's partly so the children can have access to me easily outside of lessons, and I can chat to them, uh, and also because it's helpful. But uh, when they're in the dinner queue, and I have to stop them because there's too many in the canteen, you know what they do? Let me in. Go on, go on, let us in, let us in. Oh, it's unfair, you let them in. Oh, and then they come out, it's sexist, it's racist, it's this, you're stopping me because I'm, it's sizist, I'm too small, or I'm too tall. They go on at you, because they know that that's going to get at me. So eventually I just let them in. Others who are more subtle come up and say things like, Sir, I did really enjoy your assembly. That's a really good line, that. I've learned that one over the years, so I say, oh, would you like to have a discussion about it? Which bit did you like the most? And then you can see they're completely disinterested in it. They're just trying to get around me. And the ones who I always let in, the ones who come up and say, 
Sheffield Wednesday, the greatest football team. In you go, straight up. But they've learned that one. But you know the idea of being nagged? And this woman just keeps on going at this judge. She persevered. She wanted justice. And so in the end, he gave in and gave her the justice. We should give a big cheer, shouldn't we? She got what she deserved. She got justice. This is a how much more story. There are quite a few how much more stories in Jesus' words. Um, and because it goes on and says, the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice. And quickly. I like the bit at the end. And quickly. It's a how much more. If an unjust, a moral judge gives justice to a widow... How much more will our just judge of the almighty, of the almighty judge of the universe, give us, his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night, justice? That's still how it's meant to be. You probably know other stories like that. There's that other story, parable of the persistent neighbor. You know that one, don't you? Where um, there's this guy waiting for his visitors, waiting for, they've got some very important visitors coming to see him. He's got the meal ready. Now remember, it's a hot country, I mean, uh, and so food doesn't last overnight. Uh, you can't stick it in the fridge. So it's got this food ready, and there is a camel pile up on the motorway or something. They don't get there. They don't arrive. It's going dark. What do you do? Well, you eat the food yourself, don't you? Because otherwise it goes to waste. Well, talking about Yorkshiremen, that's what we'd do, and we? we would we'd eat the food. So he eats all the food. And of course, what happens then? Once they've eaten all the food, the visitors turn up. Sorry we're late. Terrible shock horror. No food to give the visitors. So what do you do? You go around to your neighbours and say, have you got any food left over? Unfortunately, he says, the door is shut of the neighbours. Now, uh, when the door was shut in those days, it meant don't disturb. It didn't mean come and knock on the door, because this was a a society where you lived outside. The only time you actually went inside was at night for security, because you're going to sleep. So the door shut. It doesn't say knock on the door. It says keep away. I don't know about you, but... What's, what's a sort of written rule, or unwritten rule, should I say, of ringing somebody up in the evening? At what time do you say, is it too late to ring? We, we, all have the, we must have this debate, all of us. Whenever I've mentioned this to anyone, everyone always comes up with nine o'clock. Don't know why nine o'clock is the time. Because some people go to sleep, or go to bed at nine o'clock. You know, that sort of idea. We don't ring at nine. What about social media? Ask the, ask the kids this. When was the, what's the latest time you can message your mate? And they looked at me like, what are you talking about? There is no latest time. No matter what time, two o'clock in the morning, whenever, you just do it. And that's why, I don't know if you've, you have your phone there and you haven't turned it off and it's pinging away. Usually your kid's asking for a lift somewhere or you're messaging you. But this is different, we haven't worked the rules out about social media. But this was too late to go next door. But it says the man went and knocked on the door. Can I have some food for my visitors? Can I have some food? And the bloke inside says, go away, I'm in bed. My children in bed. The animals are in bed. Go away. He's knocking up the whole street. They'll be opening the windows and shouting out. Be quiet. And other things. But it says he kept on knocking. And so he gets his food eventually. Not because of friendship, says Jesus, but because of shameless audacity. Shamelessness, we'd say. This bloke will not go away, so he gets what he needs. And Jesus says, how much more will God give you what you need? Ask, seek, knock, because he's wanting to give us. Persevere in prayer. Persevere at knocking on the door. Or oh, there's another story, which is in the same, uh, just past the same parable, where it talks about Jesus says, look, you lot, you're not very good at being parents. He's very, he's very blunt about this. He says, you're not very good at being parents, but even you lot know how to give good gifts to your children. If your child comes and asks you for a loaf, for a piece of bread, do you give them a stone and say, go and break your teeth on that? Or if they ask for a fish, you give them a snake and say, get that down your neck. Or the last thing, if they ask for An egg. Do you give them not a hen's egg, but a scorpion's egg? And when you take the top off, you can just see that little tail with a big sting at the end. Of course you're not going to do that. Even the worst parents are not going to do that. So if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give good things 
to those who ask. Persevere in prayer. If we want to persevere in life, we need to persevere in prayer. The two things go together because God is willing to give it. So what do we ask for? We ask for justice. That's what the parable is about, isn't it? It's asking for justice. Now, some of us get a bit sort of concerned about that because actually, we shouldn't be asking for justice, should we? Because if we got our just desserts, uh, we'd be going to hell, wouldn't we? If you know what I mean? Think about it. Because actually, it's, it's, the whole thing about Easter is that we don't get what we deserve. We get the free gift and gracious and merciful gift of eternal life because of all that Jesus did. So what does it mean, asking for justice? When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for God's just and righteous rule here on earth, that heaven will break through on earth. And when we're asking for justice, we're asking for God's justice to be seen, that God will be active. We're to pray day and night as chosen ones. Do you sometimes just desperately look around to see God's hand at work in our society, uh, in our city, in our church, in our world? Next week on our collective worship at school, I put two videos for the youngsters. One is Stormzy. I'm sure you're all into Stormzy. Um, maybe not quite the right age group, but anyway, there we go. Stormzy, uh, who won a Brit Award uh, this year. And of course, when he gets his Brit Award, he thanks God. First and foremost, I thank God for my award. The second one I put up, which maybe we'll know more about, is Tyson Fury. Having sort of beaten the brains out of Deontay Wilder, he then says, thank you to my Lord Jesus. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a great video. You have to look it up. Right? And he thanks the Lord Jesus. Now, both these characters, I don't think, are particularly known for their, their righteous lifestyles, but their first things they do is to thank God. And I tell you, I'm desperate to show the kids that it's quite cool to thank God and to see God at work in your life, that he's got a plan for your life. So I've stuck both videos in for them uh, this week because we're desperate, aren't we, to see God at work to see God's rule of justice, to see that our faith in God is justified. Don't you feel like that? That Our faith in God, despite all the suffering, is producing perseverance, and that perseverance producing character, and character producing hope. Perseverance changes suffering, transforms suffering into hope, on that verse in Romans 5 where we started. And we're to pray and persevere in prayer so we can see that transformation taking place. Are you giving up the faith? Are things happening around you that makes you think, I'm not going to persevere? Persevere in prayer. Keep crying out to the Lord. Did you see as we finish that enigmatic rhetorical question at the end of the parable, which doesn't seem to quite fit? Suddenly says, after Jesus says, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. It then says, however, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith on the earth? And it's left hanging. (laughs) Just left hanging, that question. And I think it's a question to us. It's to persevere in the faith by persevering in prayer, asking for God's rule and justice to break through into our lives and into our society so that our faith in the great just God is justified. I hope that's all of our prayers at this time, and especially at this time of Lent. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we cry out to you day and night that you will break through from heaven. Lord, we ask so you will give us justice. We seek the answers to what is happening in our world. We knock on the door so that heaven's door will be opened. Lord, we pray for justice. We pray for your just rule. And we pray that it may come quickly.